Hey guys, Buildzoid here, and today we're going to be taking a look at some of the load line calibration settings on the MSI MPG B650i Edge Wi-Fi motherboard with a Ryzen 7 950X. Um, and the oscilloscope that I'm using for this is a Rigol HD0104. Now, I bought, like, the oscilloscope and the CPU and the motherboard, so big thank you to the channel supporters for making those purchases possible, because, well, without you, videos like this one wouldn't be possible. So, yeah, much appreciated. And uh, with that out of the way, let's go into how this is set up. So the oscilloscope is hooked, uh, is connected to the motherboard through some 50 ohm coax. That coax is soldered to a multi-layer ceramic capacitor uh, on the back of the CPU socket as far away from the vCore VRM as possible. This is to try get as like much of the effects of the power, like power distribution network on the motherboard into the measurements. Uh, unfortunately, obviously, if we're measuring from the back of the motherboard, uh, yeah, like back of the motherboard, uh, we do not see the effects of the uh, CPU socket on the voltage regulation at the actual silicon, as well as like the substrate, but mostly the CPU socket, because CPU sockets have kind of a lot of resistance to them. Um, so yeah, the scope is going to be measuring like the most noticeable part is like we're going to see the average voltage being significantly higher than what the actual silicon is seeing, at, like uh, when we're under high load. At low load, there's not a lot of voltage drop across the CPU socket because there's not a lot of current. Um, one of the other potential side effects of this is that the CPU socket should have some amount of inductance, then like the vias going to the back of the motherboard have some inductance, and so theoretically we should be seeing less undershoot and over well actually overshoot we might be seeing more because the overshoot is supposed to like originate from the out uh, from the uh, inductors of the vcore vrm um but the undershoot starts at sort of the cpu right because the, the the cpu basically tries to pull a bunch of current and so the voltage right at the cpu falls off a cliff and then that propagates backwards towards the vrm um so basically with this measurement set up, theoretically we should be seeing somewhat less undershoot and somewhat more overshoot. Um, but um, just to get some idea of like which load line calibration settings are good and bad, this is already like good enough. Like I, it's actually kind of good enough for that. Um, like this already, yeah, like it's not as good. Like I wish I could measure directly at the CPU, but setting that up is not very practical. Um, and so for just like, being able to figure out which LLC setting is best on a motherboard or even some cross motherboard comparisons because the thing is if you're measuring a complete voltage regulation disaster on the back of the CPU socket uh yeah the, the whatever's happening at the silicon is probably just as bad if not worse right so um if you got like really like so big differences between motherboards can be easily compared by just looking at like back of socket measurements um but anyway um, yeah, so that's the connection and like some of the reasoning behind the connection is just convenient. It, it's not, it's not the, yeah, it's not ideal, but it's the most convenient place and it should work pretty well. Um, and then of course, because I am just soldering coax directly to the board, I do have a 50 ohm termination at the oscilloscope. Um, now then, uh, oh, and the scope is on the full 100 megahertz bandwidth. Um, now then, for the settings that we're going to be taking a look at, we're only going to be taking a look at two LLCs today because, um, well, the the load line calibration settings on the, this board, well, one of them has issues. So mode one should never, ever be used. Okay? It is really bad. And actually, um, we're going to start with mode eight so that I can show you how, like, good LLC is supposed to look. And then we're going to switch to mode one and you're going to like, it, it's a complete disaster. So yeah. Um, and we're not going to be pushing the CPU very hard for this because I don't like what I see when I use mode one, like at all. Also this motherboard, this motherboard is like surprisingly clunky for an MSI motherboard. Like this is some like, yeah, this is basically like Gigabyte ASRock level clunkiness, except it's on an MSI board. And actually, ASRock's AM5 and Gigabyte's AM5 motherboards are actually pretty well behaved, especially compared to this. Um, where, like, first of all, you don't want to use the override mode. It's, like, it breaks a whole bunch... Well, it breaks all of your temperature monitoring and power monitoring, and it, it breaks a whole bunch of stuff, um, which is interesting. And the other thing... 
uh, is that it has like a weird 1.3 volt core voltage limit. So if you're trying to push high voltages, it also doesn't work for that, which just, I don't like, wouldn't the whole point of an override mode that like disables all of the monitoring be the, that you can run really unsafe voltages? Apparently not. Anyway, um, then we have the AMD overclocking mode. Um, this one also usually just stops at 1.3 volts, but if you're on the AMD overclocking mode, if you go uh, to per CCD, you can set the CPU CCD voltage over here, and then you can go over 1.3 volts. Um, now, with Ryzen 7000 series CPUs, they do get, like, they roll over with voltage really quickly, so the only time you would ever really be want to push voltages that high is if you're benching, like, 3D Mark physics, um, like Time Spy, uh, fire strike physics, Vantage, because Vantage you're actually, actually Time Spy you're also going to be running without SMT on a 7950X. Um, so these are all very like low heat load tests, so you can run them at high voltages. For something like Cinebench, you're probably going to experience voltage rollover at like 1.25 volts. Um, maybe a bit later if you have the CPU on direct die or something, and like good direct die, because the... That's, like, my experience with trying to do direct die on AM5 is that it's very easy to end up with a direct die setup that runs worse than if you just kept the IHS installed. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, like, direct die is quite fiddly. And that's why I don't really like it very much. Anyway, um, so, yeah, so we're going to use the AMD overclocking mode for the core voltage control because... The override mode is, like, broken, and we're not really interested in offset modes right now. So we're going to set our core voltage to 1.1 volts, which is very low, especially for the kinds of workloads that I plan to run. Um, and we're going to run 4.8 gigahertz. And this is actually going to work. Like, even with mode 8 LLC, we're actually going to be getting, like, 1.055-ish volts uh, at the actual silicon. Um which we will take a look at. And yeah, that's all we're going to do for now, except that we also want to disable the C-states, because I don't feel like... Uh, like, if we have the C-states turned on, the CPU goes into, like, a deep uh, idle state, which, I mean, is cool um, if, you know, you were doing this for daily, but if you're benching or something, then you don't really want the C-states doing, well, anything. Um, so, yeah, we're just going to disable those, and that's all we need to do. And now we're going to restart and take a look at the sort of best case scenario for the voltage regulation on this motherboard. Now, you might also notice that, like, there's a VRM switching frequency option on this board. That doesn't do anything, um, as is, like, that's kind of the funny thing um, with most modern, uh, yeah, most modern digital voltage controllers. The switching frequency under most circumstances does, like, raising it doesn't do anything, at least not on motherboards. On some GPUs, it can be helpful, and that might just be down to how the control loop, like, how the, yeah, control loop of, like, various GPU voltage regulators is set up. But in my experience with motherboards, changing the switching frequency, best case scenario, j doesn't really do anything for the voltage regulation. Uh, and in some scenarios, I've seen it cause some very strange behavior where the voltage, like, doesn't, like, doesn't go where it's supposed to go, so... Um, yeah, um, there's, there's no reason on this motherboard to change it. Like, I tried 500 kilohertz, I tried 1000 kilohertz, it didn't do anything weird at 1000 kilohertz, which is better than some of the other motherboards I've tested, like, um, I think it was the Unify X, where if you use the highest switching frequency settings, the core voltage would just sort of drift around under load for some reason, which shouldn't happen, but it did, um, and, uh, yeah, but at least the voltage, like, so at least, like, the voltage regulation doesn't get weirdly broken like it does on some other motherboards when you, uh, max out the switching frequency. But there's really no reason to max it out because it doesn't improve the voltage regulation and it does increase the heat output of the VRM. Um, because, yeah, e even, it, like, the, the, the switching losses are still there even if the voltage regulation doesn't get better. So... Anyway, here we are in Hardware Info. We can see that at idle, our core voltage is, like, 1.1 volts. And our voltage at the oscilloscope is basically 1.1 volts. They're not going to be exactly matched because, well, test setup limitations, right? Um, actually, I'm kind of surprised that they're that the scope is like a little bit lower than what the motherboard is reading. But I mean, then yeah, than what the CPU is reading. But well, whatever. That's still fine. Yeah, the scope is a little low. Anyway. Um, 
It doesn't really matter. Um, Because, yeah, at idle, we're not really pulling any current. And also, I don't know how, like, accurate that voltage reading is, right? Like, it's not going to be way off, but it's not going to be, like, I'm... Yeah, I'm not not sure how accurate that voltage reading is from the uh, VRM itself. Now, this voltage reading right here is actually from the silicon um, of the CPU. Um, so it's not going to match the oscilloscope once we hit the uh, hit a load. So here we have small FFT Y cruncher, um, which pulls about 155 amps at 1.0. I'm looking at the wrong leading, reading, uh, 1.055 volts. Um, and yeah, and you can see on the oscilloscope that right now our core voltage is all the, like 70 millivolts above that, which makes sense. That's roughly the amount of voltage drop I would expect for a CPU socket, um, for like the AM5 CPU socket. Um, yeah, so as well as, of course, the like board itself, right? So, yeah, so that's that's what's going on with that is just... Yeah, um, so the average vol voltage reading is just fine. And also this is like the cur like current draw at like 4.8 gigahertz, obviously. And so while we're running this, um, our uh, oscilloscope is measuring the following, and I'm just gonna bring the trigger onto these spikes. Um, oh, my. And we're gonna try trigger on one of these. So what's going on with these spikes is that Windows, and actually I should have tried to capture a few of them at the same time. Oh, I'm all the way down to one millisecond. Well, that makes sense. Okay. So what's going on with these is that uh, Windows has a uh, event timer, which it uses to check that everything is like working correctly. Now that event timer, uh, has like it can change how quickly it runs um but right now it's set to like by default it starts at 64 uh 64 hertz and if you're playing back a video or something it'll go up to a thousand hertz just to make sure that video playback is smooth and that kind of thing so like it'll go faster to maintain like smoothness basically but yeah since we don't have anything going on that would require smoothness it just ticks along at 64 hertz and so every 16.25 milliseconds, uh, which you can see here, we have, you know, zero, 15 milliseconds is right here. And this spike is right at like 16.25. And that I think is 64 Hertz. Um, anyway, so what basically happens is this part right here, which is nice and level, this is Y Cruncher doing its thing, right? Pulling lots of current and very consistently because the Y Cruncher configuration that I'm running here is very fixed load. It doesn't vary, like, it's not very memory bound. It basically runs out of the L3 cache. Actually might be, yeah, it should be basically set to run out of the L3 cache right now. And so the current draw is very constant because it doesn't constant, like, it doesn't have to access memory or anything. Uh, and so, you know, it's pulling a lot of current and then Windows event timer ticks over, Windows rudely interrupts the workload and we get this big voltage spike as the workload temporarily gets paused so that Windows can do its Windows things. Um, that was the wrong knob. Damn it. At least my waveform is still here. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. You know, so we have Y Cruncher happily running, Windows interrupts it, we get this big uh, load release overshoot spike, and then immediately Y Cruncher resumes and we get this little voltage dip as the uh, workload ramps back up, right? And then the voltage recovers and sort of levels off. And then, yeah, there's still some random noise in that, but, you know, um, CPUs are very, very noisy. So that's to be expected. Now, I'm going to try... Uh, cause some worse transients that trigger more undershoot. Because right now, if we're just running like this, you'll notice, oh, and here you can see the event timer just ramped up to a thousand hertz for some reason. Yeah. So that's the event timer ramp ramping up to like its maximum resolution anyway, or maximum speed. But anyway, so while we're, you know, sitting here running like this and I want to clear the statistics again. Nope, not that. There. So yeah, while it's running like this, you'll notice that basically these spikes are bottoming out some 40 millivolts below our average voltage, which is actually quite good because even if there wasn't any like noticeable downward spikes, uh, that like 
like the steady state point of this isn't exactly a flat line, right? So that, that might have like 20 millivolts peak to peak. So we're getting spikes that are like 20 millivolts below that. So like 40 millivolts of undershoot, which is a solid result. Um, now, if I move the mouse around, I should be able to make it worse. We should be able to trigger on that. So we're just going to zoom in. There we go. And so now Windows actually, like, obviously we have, like, the event timer spikes, but over here we also have Windows trying to process, like, mouse movement for a bit. And then I guess Y-Cruncher resumes and we get a really serious voltage dip. Now, the thing is, um, you can't really get AM5 motherboards that don't do this. <laughs> okay, that's not true. But most AM5 motherboards, the stock load line uh, calibration from AMD is very shallow. And the way the LLC settings work typically is that they're just a percentage of the factory load line calibration from AMD. Um, and because the like factor like the AMD like the load line from AMD is so shallow, uh, even with the highest VDroop LLC that this motherboard offers, uh, which is mode eight, uh, yeah, we still get a lot of very measurable undershoot on the back of the CPU socket. Um, and the thing is, that's actually typical for AM5 motherboards, even high-end AM5 motherboards. In fact, there's only one AM5 motherboard that I've measured that has an L that has LLC options that won't do this. As in, any kind of transient will, like, you'll have a flat line and all transients will only go up. So you never get, like, actual undershoot. Um, and so the reason I bring that up is because it's kind of hard to say how significant this is. <laughs> from like a stability perspective, because I don't have a motherboard uh, that would allow me to test without this. Actually, I guess maybe with the EVC2, I might be able to change. Um, I might be able to do that with this board. But anyway, like I've not, basically the issue is like, I'm not sure how noteworthy this is for like affecting the stability of uh, various workloads. Though I guess it's worth noting that if you're running like benchmarks, you probably shouldn't be wiggling the mouse around because you know like these mouse movement processing interrupts like they're bad for your benchmark right they're, they're gonna slow it down um so you shouldn't be doing that anyway <laughs> but if like it, it would potentially be like oh that that could be a limiting factor on stability i'm just not sure how significant that is because the thing is mode one or mode two because you should never use mode one on this motherboard but like higher like more aggressive LLC settings on this board and on other boards will actually translate to like worse stability when overclocking, um, even without having to like jiggle the mouse around. So yeah, I'm not sure like how much, cause the thing is like ideally every, like this motherboard would have a LLC setting where we wouldn't get this. But the thing is, I don't want to be too hard on this board if, like, that's the case for, like, 90% of motherboards. Also, if you're wondering, the one motherboard that I've measured that has the option not to, like, have these, like, under, like, not have undershoot uh, is the Crosshair X670E Gene. I would assume the Hero has the same settings as well as the uh, Crosshair X670 Extreme from Asus. Um because they all share very similar VRM designs, and so I'd imagine the VRM configuration in terms of, like, LLC settings is very similar. Um... So yeah, th that was the only board that I've measured where like you could set an LLC with enough VDroop that you wouldn't get measurable undershoot on the back of the CPU socket. So on one hand, yes, I would prefer it if I couldn't, you know, measure this, as in like this wasn't happening. Um, but uh, on the other hand, I don't really have like comparison data for how like noteworthy it, this is because sure if you use like mode 2 or something you might be shaving like 100 megahertz off of your max static cpu overclock but i'm not sure how much of an improvement there is to gain with better voltage regulation than what we're seeing right here um so and it is something i do wonder about but without like a board that is just better i don't really have a way to test that so it's a bit annoying um Anyway, so that's mode 8, and basically mode 8 on this motherboard can be summarized as, oh, it's about the same as everything except a crosshair. So, I'd say that's a pretty solid result for what is basically the cheapest ITX uh, AM5 motherboard there is. At least as, well, 
as far as I know, one of the cheapest AM5 ITX boards. Um, at least when I was buying this thing, it was the cheapest. So, yeah. Um, and honestly, what kind of annoys me is that, like, if we just had a, like, a Mode 10 LLC or something, we could probably get rid of the noticeable undershoot. Um, but anyway, so yeah, Mode 8 performance is basically comparable to, like, low LLC on, low or standard LLC on Gigabyte boards, the highest V-droop option on ASRock boards, uh, the highest V-droop option on non-crosshair Asus boards, um, like the Strix boards, for example. Um, at least the B650 Strix board. I don't know if maybe the X670 boards have, like, a different VRM design. They, they may, may very well. Uh, and they might share VRM settings with the crosshairs, but, yeah, I don't know. Um, anyway, so that's mode 8. Um, nothing particularly impressive, but also nothing particularly, like... Like, it's not worse than 90% of AM5 motherboards, so, like, <laughs> I don't really see much point in complaining. Um, and 90% might be more like 97. Because, like, if, if I'm right, if I'm correct about it only being the crosshairs that have, like, the perfect LLC options, uh, then there's literally three AM5 motherboards where you have a zero undershoot LLC option. Um... So even if there was a hundred boards, that would be well. I guess the, is there a hundred AM5 boards? I I'd imagine there's a hundred AM5 boards. So I, I'm gonna go with like ninety-seven percent is probably closer to the actual percentage than, uh, uh, what did I say first? Ninety percent. Yeah. Anyway, that doesn't matter. Let's take a look at why you should never ever use mode one. So, um, as you just saw, like we weren't crashing on mode eight, right? Like the stability was good. Everything was nice and stable. So now we're going to switch over to mode one. And it's not going to be stable. And it's honestly like this. Well, the, for one thing, the stability hit is actually weird. Because while I do say that, oh, the higher V-Droop LLCs give you better voltage regulation. The funny thing is, usually if you raise LLC, the average voltage increases more than the undershoot. So if you raise the average voltage by uh, 30 millivolts and your undershoot gets 10 millivolts worse, your minimum voltage is still higher, right? So that's not going to translate into worse overclocking results unless you're already in like voltage rollover territory due to thermals being too high. Um, but... And we're nowhere near voltage rollover, right? Like, we're at, like, 1.1 volts here. Um, with mode 8 LLC, the CPU can go over 5 gigahertz at, like, 1.2-ish volts for uh, white crunch or small FFTs. Now, mode 1 is a complete disaster in terms of voltage regulation because it doesn't... Uh, like, yeah, it removes all of the V-droop, Um so our idle voltage and our load voltage are going to be exactly the same. In fact, our idle voltage is slightly higher than what we set in the BIOS, which is a bit suspicious, but that could just be a, like, reading error. But what isn't suspicious is, uh, well, let, let's just see how long uh, Y-Cruncher manages to run. I mean, if you're looking at the oscilloscope, you can probably tell that was bad. Very bad. An absolute freaking disaster. But let's take a look at that disaster in, uh, cl like, closer. And as you can see, the, like, yeah, that, that affected the stability. Like, the workload lasted what? Um, does it even tell us how long it ran? Oh, yeah, it ran for, like, uh, apparently 0 0.023 seconds. That doesn't seem right. I'm going to go with it. It didn't run for very long. We're just going to go with that, right? Um... So, yeah, that's that's a bit of an issue. So what's going on there? Well, let's go into single mode. Yeah, that's um that's concerning. Also, we can actually, this happened so quickly that we can actually see the initial ramp up of White Cruncher. Wait, could we zoom in on that? Because that is so rare to be able to actually capture the exact moment the, that an all core workload starts. Because it's a real pain to trigger on. Like the Windows event timer makes triggering on like the, 
the start of a workload very difficult. Um, and there's not really much to see there. So I guess I shouldn't be, I, and I didn't expect it to, because you might think, oh, when you start something like Cinebench or Y-Cruncher or Prime95, right, all of the threads just magically start at exactly the same time. Yeah, they don't. <laughs> like, that's just not how it works. Um, I guess this over here might be the workload. Actually, we might have like a pre pre ramp and then then the actual workload hitting over here. So maybe this over here is significant. If I had a current probe hooked up, then we'd have a better idea of what's going on. But I don't. So yeah, um, I don't know. If people are interested, I might do more testing on that. But anyway, let's take a look at the disaster that is Mode One LLC. Closelier. So previously. What would basically happen when Y-Cruncher is running is, you know, Y-Cruncher would be doing its thing. And then uh, Windows would very rudely interrupt the workload, which would cause a load release overshoot. And then the workload would ramp right back up. Um, we'd get some undershoot. And then the VRM would pull the voltage back up to where it's supposed to go. Except what seems to be happening here, and this is speculation on my part, is that Windows does the Windows thing, interrupts the workload, we get our load release overshoot, then the workload resumes, so we get a bunch of undershoot, the VRM tries to correct for the undershoot way too hard, and the voltage tops out at like over 1.35 volts. And then the VRM re realizes its mistake, and pulls the voltage down way too hard. So the voltage bottoms out at like 900 something millivolts. And then it realizes that it's screwed up and it pulls the voltage way back up way too hard again. And then it realizes, and you get the idea. And it just sort of oscillates between way too much voltage and way too little voltage and way too much voltage and way too little voltage. And basically on a properly configured VRM, this should never happen, ever. Now, this is obviously a result of the fact that we've removed all of the V-droop, so the voltage regulator, you know, when it sees any amount of undershoot, like, is desperately trying to pull the voltage back up to where it's supposed to be, and overshooting the, the target voltage by a massive amount in the process. Um, but, like, my, th my thought process here is, like, look, MSI should have tested for this, because, like, why would you have settings in the BIOS that allow this kind of behavior? Now, admittedly, this behavior isn't universal. Um, it's really quite hard to trigger in, say, Cinebench. Um, but there's a bunch of different configurations of Prime95 that'll do it. You can do it with AVX instructions, without AVX instructions, with uh, AVX512 instructions, with AVX2 instructions, like... So it's not like it's specifically Y-Cruncher that does this. It seems to be basically any very high current workload can trigger this, as far as I can tell. And Cinebench just doesn't seem to be intensive enough to, to trigger this kind of behavior. Um, though admittedly, I didn't try to run Cinebench at like a really high all-core overclock. So, you know, it might like this might show up at higher voltages even in Cinebench. Um, and yeah, this, this is just a complete disaster. Like, as far as I'm concerned, MSI should basically, if, like, with the next BIOS update, they should ideally just remove mode one. And, like, they could just shift all of the LLC settings around to accommodate that. Because the funny thing is, you like, mode one is, like, the zero V-droop setting, but mode two, and the thing is, I think mode two might sometimes also do it, but this is, like, I, I've not been a like I've I've tried to trigger this on mode two and I've not been successful on the latest BIOS. I think I managed to trigger this behavior on mode two on a previous BIOS version, but yeah, not a hundred like at this point not a hundred percent certain. I kind of want to get this over with. Mode one should get removed. Like it should just straight up get removed because th this this is like a disaster. This is quite possibly not safe for the CPU. Um, because the thing is, like, normally I don't make a big deal out of overshoot because overshoot happens when the CPU pulls no current, right? But that's not happening here because we were running Y-Cruncher. Y-Cruncher got interrupted by Windows. Then Y-Cruncher resumed and the voltage regulator freaked out. So theoretically, while, while we're getting this, like, uncontrolled freaking oscillation of the voltage regulator... Um, 
Why Cruncher is still running at full power, which is why we're doing this testing at 1.1 volts, because uh, we're we're hitting like peaks of 1.4. Um, so yeah, like I would I would remove mode one. I would pr like maybe even mode two, because the funny thing is, like even on mode eight, there's so little V droop that. There, like, it doesn't really, like, it's not a, like, it's not really a big deal if, like, uh, you remove mode one, because, like, why would you ever use mode one? I mean, even if it wasn't this broken, so like, mode two already delivers a basically zero V droop uh, configuration, and mode two doesn't seem to do this. Might need more testing to verify that it definitely doesn't do this, but, like, mode two, if your goal is to just remove the V droop, mode two does a perfectly adequate job of that. And I haven't been able to trigger this behavior on mode 2 anywhere near as reliably as it happens on mode 1. Um, I mean, I don't really need to do much. Like, mode 1 just kind of does this. All right, so... Yeah, this... They should just remove mode 1. And if you have this board, you should never, ever, ever use mode 1. Because mode 1 is a voltage regulation disaster. Um, this is basically the worst thing I've ever measured. Because I've measured some other boards where, like, yeah, they'd have, like, a massive load re release spike or a massive amount of undershoot. And, you know, that's really annoying because it makes your... Especially the massive amount of undershoot means that the board kind of sucks for static overclocks. Um, or if you're, like, the fun... If we're talking about, say, Intel motherboards, the motherboard just sucks for overclocking in general. Because the thing with Ryzen CPUs, if you're using the boost algorithm, boost algorithm can actually clock stretch through, uh, like transient on like undershoot volt like voltage undershoot quite well so on p like if you're using pbo or something bad voltage regulation doesn't really affect you very much whereas if you're running like static all core overclocks with a ryzen cpu then bad voltage regulation becomes a massive problem um but let's say you were on like a z370 motherboard because that's that's the like worst voltage regulation i ever measured was a z370 motherboard yeah that would like intel cpus don't have a pbo style boost system at least not on z370 they didn't um and so on that motherboard like you just couldn't overclock because the voltage regulate like the 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 voltage regulation was so bad that like it would just like you would like, a CPU that would do 5 gigahertz plus on other boards would max out at, like, 4.8 on, on the board with really, really bad voltage regulation. So, yeah. Um, so, you know, that was bad, but, like... And, like, detrimental to overclocking, but this this just seems detrimental to the health of the CPU, period. Not, not even, like, oh, this is bad for overclocking. This, no, this is just bad under all circumstances. Also, this still happens if you use it with PBO. Like, you might be thinking, like, oh, mode 1 uh, with, like, the boost algorithm. And by PBO, I mean, like, clear CMOS turn on mode 1, and this will still happen. Um, so, yeah, there is no scenario with this motherboard where you should be using mode 1. I also kind of wonder if there are other MSI motherboards with this voltage controller, because if there are, then those probably have the same issue. Where on mode one, the also like the voltage regulator has a tendency to just oscillate under high load like this um, after a transient under high load. So yeah, um, this is bad. This is very 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 bad. Um, so anyway, um, that's the that's the main reason I actually like was like really committed to making this video is just like because yeah, if you have this board. Or have boards with a similar VRM to this board. You should not use mode 1. It is terrible. Um, it, it's like literally the worst thing I've ever measured. And I've measured some bad motherboards. <laughs> but nothing nothing like this. Um, so. Yeah. Anyway. Um, I guess for comparison we could also take a look at mode 2 just to, like, sort of compare against how, like, mode 1 behaves. The thing is with... Oh, I guess we should just set the voltage lower. Um, so that the average voltage is the same. Because, yeah, mode 2 on this motherboard already doesn't have very much uh, V-droop. Um, and I just want to just sort of do a comparison in, like, minimum... Like, the undershoot of mode 1 versus mode 8. Just to show you the difference between, like... Between the two... Um, 
And if we're if we're lucky, I'll get the like we'll it'll, it'll have that like in like control loop instability again. Um, actually, I kind of hope it doesn't do that, but yeah. Anyway, so we're gonna set the voltage lower now because with mode eight we have a lot of e droop, so the core voltage obviously gets lower under load. Um, and previously, our average voltage on the oscilloscope for mode 8 with 1.1 volts was like 1.12, if I remember correctly. Um, and our core voltage on the SVI3 TFN sensor was 1.055, right? So those are the voltages that we're looking for. Because um, obviously, if the average voltage is higher than, you know... My point about how, well, if you have more, like, if the undershoot increases by less than the increase in average voltage, then you still get a stability boost. I'm just going to clear our statistics. I'm going to pull up hardware info again. I'm actually not sure how much of a difference we're going to see between mode 2 and mode, mode 8, because even mode 8 is, like, very aggressive, in my opinion. Um, so, yeah, we're at 1.65 right now, and... So we hit small FFTs. We're still at like 1.6. All right. So we're actually getting slightly more voltage than mode 8 was. I imagine Y Cruncher might crash eventually. Um, and yeah, we're getting a slightly higher average voltage than with uh, mode 8 on the oscilloscope. I'm just going to pull us back out to 10 milliseconds per division. And... You set the statistics, and actually the voltage regulation is... Eh, it is lower. <laughs> it's not much lower, though. I mean, yeah, so it might be like 20 millivolts worse, I think. Because, like, the average voltage is somewhat higher. And this is, like, previously we were bottoming out at, like, 1.08-ish. And now we're bottoming out at, like, 1.06... Well, 7-ish. So actually, it's like 10 millivolts worse. Not really much of a difference. I wonder if moving the mouse around is going to make it really upset. Eh, it might not crash. This might actually be better than high-end mother, like a bunch of some of the other boards that I've tested when, when you're running like a very low V-droop. Which would make sense. Like, I had really high hopes when I was, you know, soldering the coax to this motherboard because 8-phase V-Core VRM, smart power stages, monolithic power systems voltage controller. This is the first time I get to measure a monolithic power systems controller on something other than an NVIDIA GPU. Um, and NVIDIA GPUs are very different in terms of power delivery from, like, basically everything else. <laughs> Um, well, Ryzen CPUs are actually kind of similar to NVIDIA GPUs these days, but um, yeah, so, you know, and more importantly, uh, all of the filtering capacitors, like the bulk filtering capacitors on this thing are SMD aluminum polymers, um, which in theory should give very good voltage regulation. And in practice, uh, I guess they kind of do. Because like, but then again, I'm not sure... I, I don't, yeah, I, the thing is, I don't think I have measurements for another high-end board at voltages this low um, that I could compare against off the top of my head. Like, I, I did all my other AM5 uh, VRM testing, like, ages and ages ago. Um, so, yeah. And I wasn't really, like, planning to do a whole bunch of cross-motherboard comparisons. Um, so the, the data is not very easily referenced. <laughs> But yeah, this, this this is actually surprisingly decent. Like, I was really expecting mode 2 to be a lot worse than mode 8, but it's, like, it's worse, but it's not that much worse. Then again, mode 8, in my opinion, isn't that good, so... <laughs> Maybe the bar's just too low. Um, and, like, we are running slightly more voltage than I was running with mode 8. Um... But yeah, so I think I'm going to, yeah, you know, I am I'm, might not make a video of it, but I think I might, for my own reference, make, like, do some testing of some, well, I have a specific board in mind that I want to want to check, because I think this might actually be, this might be second best to the gene, 
which would be kind of ridiculous, but not necessarily that surprising. Also, another funny uh, ITX motherboard like power delivery advantage is the power plane is super short. Like the VRM is rammed right up against the socket because there's just no space, um, which can help in some ways. Um, so. Yeah. Anyway, um, that's it for the video. So hopefully you found this somewhat interesting, if not particularly useful. And it ended up being way longer than I would... Well, that's just how it goes here. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, yeah. Hopefully you found it somewhat interesting, if not... Per Wait, did Y-Cringer stop? Yes, Y-Cringer did stop. Um, uh, yeah, so... Thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comments section below. If you'd like to support what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking, I have a Patreon. There's a link to that down in the description below. There's also the AHOC Teespring store where you can pick up shirts, hoodies, posters, you know, the usual YouTuber merch. And I've also got a band camp if for some reason you would like to torture your ears. And that's it for the video. So thanks for watching and goodbye.